Good morning, everybody. So today is going to be um, the last lecture that is go where we're going to be talking about the teeth anatomy. We're going to be um, comparing each tooth and learning how to differentiate and what are the special characteristics. So this is awesome that we've come this far. Um, all the lectures after this are going to be either recap and we're going to be talking about a little bit more uh, towards the occlusion, the oral biology of the oral cavity, and all that good stuff. Okay, so let's start with last week's question. A hockey player comes into your office with both his, both his maxillary right premolars in his hand. Which of the following characteristics would you not use to distinguish the first and the second premolar? So, according to the resources that I have, the correct question to this answer was posted as, Presence of mesolingual developmental growth. Now we discussed this last week, and we remember, recall when I said that the mesolingual developmental groove is on the first mesial uh, surface of the first premolar and distal surface of the maxillary first molar. Apparently, it's not called mesolingual developmental groove. Mesolingual developmental group is confined to only the mandibular first premolar, and it's not present on either of the maxillary premolars. So the correction is going to be on the maxillary premolar and maxillary first molar. The characteristic is called mesial concavity. Okay, so just don't, I don't want you to get confused between both because I kind of did get confused, and I was like, okay, no, this is, there, there's something going on. So just remember this, and I even put a slide for you over here. So the mesial developmental depression is the mesial concavity on the crown of the root right here. Okay, and then the mesial marginal developmental group is right here. It's on the marginal ridge, the mesial marginal ridge. The only thing is that it's aligned with the mesial developmental depression. Okay. All right, and th with this slide from last week, I had also known as mesial developmental depression, so I just removed it. I just wanted to make sure that you guys don't get confused. Okay, let's talk about the maxillary first molar. Now, remember how we talked about how the teeth in the maxillary arch start off big in the, the central incisor, they start off big, and then as they go more posterior, they get smaller. The same is true with the, maxilla with the maxillary molars, yeah. So the maxillary first molar is typically going to be your largest molar, Second molar is going to be smaller. The third molar is the smallest. Okay. So the thing you need to know about the maxillary first molar is that it has three roots. Okay. That's common because it's a maxillary tooth, right? So mesio, it has three roots: mesiobuccal, just the buccal, so two in the buccal, and one in the lingual called the palatal. The palatal is the largest root, longest, biggest dimensions, the widest, everything. So it's larger in general. And then you have the mesiobuccal and the distal buccal. The mesiobuccal is very wide buccal lingually. So it's very wide buccal lingually. I don't have a picture over here. It shows the mesiodistal. Okay. And what you need to know as well is that the maxillary first molar has four canals. Even though it has three roots, it has four canals. So in the mesiobuccal root, remember how we said it's wide buccal lingually? It has two canals. Okay, I want you to remember that. I want you to associate the buccolingual, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> the mesiobuccal canal that it is wide, buccolingually, and that it has two canals. And then the distal buccal has one canal, the palatal has one canal, okay? The fourth canal in the mesiobuccal root, it's usually present just lingual to the mesiobuccal canal, okay? So you're going to have, this is the mesial one, this is the mesiobuccal, uh, canal, and this is the second one. So usually we call it MB1, MB2. This is the distal buccal, and this is the power. Okay? All right. The fourth canal usually has just to go to the mesobuccal canal. The canal is located in the mesobuccal root and may join mesobuccal canal or exit through a separate form. Okay, so when it goes into the root, just know that it might join the mesobuccal canal and then they just shape it to one canal or it just exits a different form on the same route. Okay. The pop horns in this tooth are usually prominent. 
So why do, why do why is it important for us to know that the components are, are prominent so that when we're doing restorative procedures, we can take caution so that we don't have any pop exposure, we don't destroy the tooth, we don't go into the chamber. Okay. So the mesiobuccal and mesiolingual are higher than the distofacial and palatal pulp cones. Okay, so this is important. So anything that's on the mesial side, whether it's buccal or lingual, is going to be higher. So you need to take precaution when you're doing this sort of thing. In all molars, all root canals join the pulp chamber apical to the cemental enamel junction. So this question sometimes comes in the boards. So it's important to know that in the molars, when, just know when, they, when the root canals join the uh, in the pulp chamber, it's always applicable to the uh, cemental enamel junction. Okay. The distobuccal root is the smallest. Yes, we talked about it. So what are the characteristics of the roots again? We said the palatal root is the largest in all dimensions and the longest and everything. And then we have the mesiobuccal uh, that is wide buccal lingually, and it has two canals, MB1, MB2. And then you have the distal buccal root, which is going to be the smallest root, and it has the smallest canal. Okay. The palatal root of the maxillary first molar is the third longest root in the mouth. Okay, this is interesting. Of any of the maxillary teeth. After the maxillary canine. See, the remember guys, the maxillary canine was the longest tooth in the mouth, and the mandibular canine had the longest crown. Okay, so the maxillary canine is the first longest tooth. And then the second premolar, and then the palatal root of the first molar. The palatal root is wider buccal lingually, like the mesobuccal canal, and it has a longitudinal, longitudinal depression on the lingual. It is concave on its buccal surface. When viewed from the facial, this root apex is in the line with the buccal group. Okay. So let's talk about the depression on the lingual. So on the lingual, on the crown, okay. Right here, let's see. Let me zoom in. Okay. Now I can do it. <laughs> okay, this is the lingual. So you see on the crown right here, there's this like little notch. Okay. So this is an extra cusp right here. You can see and This is a cusp. This is a cusp. That's a cusp over there. And then you have this lingual notch. Now, this lingual notch is a characteristic on the lingual surface of the maxillary first molar. It's important to know because this is like a food trap right here. And three quarters of the patients that will come into your into your office complaining of caries on the first three molar, they're gonna on the first molar. I, I mean, they're going to have caries over here. Okay, I just wanted to know that this is characteristic. Just for the maxillary first molar. Okay. Maxillary first and second molar. On the maxillary second molars, the roots are much less divergent than the root of the first molars. The palatal root is straighter than the palatal root of the first molar. Okay, this is a good comparison. This is just like the general information for you to know about the roots. I mean, there's always exceptions in, in, in every every detail in anatomy in every root so don't don't really stress yourself out trying to memorize this information but i just wanted you to know about it just in case you know out of curiosity first and it's you know so watch out for the palatal root of maxillary first molar when extracting yes remember we said that the palatal root is the largest the third largest root in the maxillary arch and it's it's quite long and large so it's the most common to get forced into the maxillary sinus, right? So that makes sense. And you do not want to perforate the maxillary sinus. That is not, um, it's not a, a procedure that you would want to go through. So just beware. And whenever you take an x-ray or whatever, like let's say, God forbid, someone took an, uh, made an extraction of the maxillary first molar and and the palatal root didn't come out, but of course you weren't there to see it. You just took an extra, and you see like this little object hanging between the maxillary sinus and the gum tissue. Excuse me. Uh, then that would be the palatal root. Okay. Uh, the 
A fisheye group is usually found in the lingual surface of axillary molars. It's called a lingual developmental group. Due to its presence, occlusal cavity perforations often need to be extended onto the lingual surface. Yep, it's right there. This group originates as an occlusal pit and terminates in a pit on the lingual surface. Okay, so it's self-explanatory. So, okay, this is an important piece of information. I put three stars next to it just so you know how important it is. The parotid duct. We all know the parotid gland. So the parotid duct right here, this duct right here, is a duct that conveys saliva from the parotid gland to the mouth at the level of that of the maxillary second molar. It's also called Stenson's duct. It's important that you know that this duct supplies saliva and that it supplies that it, it just lands on the maxillary second molar and that's where the duct ends. And it's called Stenson's duct. Okay. It's important to know which tooth it, it uh, produces saliva from, maxillary second uh, molar. And it's important to know what, what's the name of the duct. So for the parotid gland, it's called Stenson's duct because every gland has a different duct name. And we will discuss this in further uh, lectures. But it's just important for you to know, parotid gland is Stenson's duct. Okay. So let's talk about the cusps in the maxillary molars. I believe we have two scenarios for the maxillary molars with the cusp. Let's see. The distal lingual cusp on a permanent maxillary molar generally is the one that gets progressively smaller as you go posterior to the arch. So remember how we talked about the maxillary first molar uh, is bigger, is the biggest of all the molars, and the second and then the third. It's kind of the same with the cusp. So if you go to the distal lingual cusp, let's see, this is the marginal, so we're going to go distal. This is the distal lingual cusp. It gets smaller as you go posterior to the arch. So in each tooth, so it's biggest on the maxillary first molar, and then it gets smaller on the second and on the third. This is the most obvious characteristic to distinguish permanent first, second, and third molars from each other. Okay, makes sense. For maxillary molars, the primary cusp triangle formed by the mesiolingual, mesiobuccal, and distobuccal cusp. So we get a cusp triangle. Okay. Let's go see. This is the mesiolingual, mesiobuccal, and distobuccal. So you can see right here, it's highlighted. This is the triangle. The distolingual cusp is called talent's cusp. Okay. This is the distolingual cusp. And it's not part of the primary cusp triangle. So the cusp triangle is made out of three cusps, we said. So it's going to be mesiolingual, mesiobuccal, and distobuccal. Okay? The distolingual is an extra cusp, meaning that it's not a primary cusp. And if it's an extra cusp, it's going to be called talent's cusp. Note that talent's cusp might or might not be present on maxillary second and third molars. Any, also, any abnormally pr present cusp is called talent's cusp. Okay, so we know that the distolingual cusp, which is talons cusp, grows smaller as we go more posterior. And now we also know that it might even might not even be present. Okay. And sometimes a fifth cusp, cusp of carapelli, is located on the mesiolingual cusp of maxillary molar on the mesolingual cusp of maxillary molar. Sometimes it has like a bulge. Actually, you can see it here. So this is the mesolingual cusp right here. And then this is cusp of carapelli. It's a fifth cusp. Right here. You can see it. You can, the groove is what separates the both the cusps. And this is usually found on the maxillary first molar. OK. Let's talk generally about the maxillary second molar. Keep in mind when restoring a tooth, the marginal ridges of a tooth, mesial or distal, are at the same height as a tooth in proximal contact to it. OK, this is good information to know. Example, let's say we are preparing the distal, uh, the distal occlusal part of the maxillary first molar. When we're restoring that, 
the distal marginal ridge and everything. The height should be as high as the mesial marginal ridge of the maxillary second bone because it's adjacent to it and they should be both the same height. Okay, so when restoring this to occlusal surface of maxillary first molar, in order to get correct height occlusal cervically, it should be matched to the mesial marginal ridge of the maxillary second molar. Easy, right? I mean, it makes sense. All right, let's talk about mandibular molars. Enough of the maxillary molars. So that wasn't too bad, right? So with the mandibular molars, they have less characteristics. First of all, they have less roots. So it's less canals we have to worry about. So it has two roots, three canals. The maxillary has three roots, four canals. Okay, so the three canals, you have two pop canals are usually found in the mesial root, same as the maxillary, mesiobuccal roots. The distal root is usually the one, the one that has one canal. So the roots in the mandibular molars are mesial and distal. The mesiobuccal canal curves more than the mesiolingual canal. And this is good to know so that when you're doing endo, you know where to follow. The mesial root is typically very thin mesiodistally, much wider facial lingually, and concave on both the mesial and distal surfaces. Okay, this is just general anatomy. The distal pulp bone is the smallest. Remember, usually the distal canal and pulp horn and everything distal is the smallest. The pulp horn is on the mesial. The pulp horn on the mesial, facially and lingually, is higher than the one on the distal. It's important to keep in mind when performing, oh, I apologize, when performing endo, endodontic procedures. I'm sure that's what it says. I'll, I'll fix it for you guys. Okay. Now. We're going to be comparing between maxillary and mandibular molars. Maxillary molars, occlusally, when you look at it, the shape is rhomboidal, and the mandibular molars, it's rectangular, right? Okay. Yeah, this is rhomboidal, and this is rectangular. Maxillary molars have two roots, while mandibular molars have two. Maxillary molars have hips and grooves on the Mandibular molars, remember that lingual developmental group I was telling you about? Yep, it's, this is what they need like. Mandibular molars, the pits and grooves are the buccal surface. Okay. So usually we have the uh, occlusal cavity that's like a, like just a round dot on the facial surface of the mandibular molar. That's very common to the case. Mandibular molars are wider facial lingually. While mandibular molars are wider than these distally. That's why it's like a rectangle, right? Okay, so in maxillary molars, one large, one small lingual cusp, right? The smallest lingual cusp is the distal lingual, which is not part of the uh, tri cusp primary cusp triangle. And we have one large, which is the mesial lingual. In mandibular molars, there are two equal sized lingual cusps. In axillary molars, it has an oblique ridge. In mandibular molars, it has a transverse ridge. This is the oblique ridge in the axillary molars. Um, it goes from the distal buccal cusp until the mesolingual cusp. Okay, this is it right here. This is oblique ridge. Transverse ridge. This is the transverse ridge over here. And it's confined to mandibular molars. Okay. So this is the oblique ridge we were talking about, formed by the union of the distal cusp bridge of the mesolingual cusp and the triangular ridge of the distal buccal cusp. Mandibular molars appear to be tilted lingually. Yep. And here you can see it, they're all tilted inside, and the maxillary molars are overlapping on top of them. Mandibular molar curve also tips distally relative to the long axis of the root. Okay. Okay, so now we are recapping everything we have learned. And we go to end our lecture today with the types of roots that we have learned so far. So we have learned three types of roots. Single, 
bifurcating and trifurcating. Bifurcating means two roots, trifurcating means three roots. Okay, for a single root, maxillary it is confined to maxillary and mandibular incisors. We already know that. Maxillary and mandibular canine, yep. Maxillary second premolar and mandibular first and second premolar. Makes sense, right? For the bifurcating or two roots, it's the maxillary first premolar. It has two roots, remember, right here, buccal and palatal, and mandibular molars. These are in this way. This is where the uh, roots are situated. And trifurcation or three roots, maxillary first and second molars, mesial buccal, distal buccal, and pal palatal. Okay. So, it's not difficult to remember. I mean, you already know all of this. All right, so now going back to the quick question. The distolingual cusp on the primitive maxillary molars is also called cusp of carpelli, palin cusp, dense invaginatus, trigon. So this is going to be it for today, and I will see you guys next week.